Amen. I appreciate that, Brother Don and Miss Kathy. And, and if it's wrong, you told him the wrong number. I'll go ahead and tell that for Leland. I, I know what he's thinking. But uh, there is no children's church this morning, but uh, for the rest of us, if you would just stand with me and turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. First John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. The scripture reads, it says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. And by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. And for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? And this is he that came by water and by blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. And there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in, in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. And if we receive the witness of men, and the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. And he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, and he that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and the life is in his Son. And he that hath the Son hath life, but he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Let's pray. Heavenly Fathers, we bow before you this morning. We thank you for the time that we've had already. We're thankful for the baptismal service. We're thankful, Lord, for the songs that we've been able to sing together as a congregation. We're thankful for the special music. We're thankful today, Lord Jesus, because it is you and you alone that was willing to take on our sin, go to the old rugged cross, endure the wrath of the Father on our behalf, shedding your blood and giving your life so we didn't have to. And then three days later, conquering death, hell, and the grave through the resurrection from the dead. And Lord Jesus, you're alive forevermore. You're seated at the right hand of the Father. You sent forth your spirit to abide within our hearts. You have given us your word, and it has been preserved for us. And, and Lord, that you are also going to return soon and very soon. And Lord Jesus, we're thankful today for who you are. We're thankful for what you've done. We're thankful for what you are doing in our lives and we're looking forward to how you're going to wrap all these things up. Lord Jesus, I pray, though, that you would help us to live in the moment, anticipating your return, but living for you in the here and now. And we live in victory because, Lord Jesus, you've overcome the world, and we in you also overcome the world. So I ask for your help to preach this morning. I ask you to hide me behind the cross. I ask for a fresh anointing of your spirit. And I pray as your word goes out that you would save the lost and revive your church. As we trust in you to do your work, as we lift you up, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This morning, I want to talk to you about the victory that we have in Christ. The victory that we have in Christ. You know, we live in a world that seems to be a lot of defeat. There's a lot of discouragement. There's a lot of depression. There's a lot of folks that are just in despair as you walk around in this whole world. It seems like it's just a mess. And we don't really have all the answers for it by any means from a worldly standpoint. And we go around this world and we see the, the struggles in the economy. We think about the struggles of all the things that are just going on in this world. Every time that you look at a news station or you 
look on the news and the internet or your whatever it may be, it's always something on there that's just almost mind-blowing. It's amazing the different things that happen. Our, our culture, our community, uh, our country is a mess, folks. And I don't want to sound like somebody who is just a pessimist, but at the same time, I don't want us to be a people who are ignorant of the reality of what's going on around us. I mean, we, we live in a messed up place. We live in a messed up culture. We live in a messed up country and world. And in and of itself, just like the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if there's no resurrection, if there's nothing beyond this world, then we are of most men miserable. We look in this world here, and it is a mess by itself. But you know what the good news is, folks? There's victory today in Christ Jesus. Even when it looks as if Satan is running rampant, and he is, he has those little lion roaming this world, seeking whom he may devour. Even when it appears that evil is ever growing in front of us, and it seems to be on every single front, and I'm not just, you know, just saying that. That's what it looks like to me. When you look at all the different things that we struggle with in this world, the wars, the rumors of wars, the wars, the different natural disasters that are going on in this whole world that we're in, when you look at the culture, it seems to be as in the days of Noah, just like Jesus said, in the last days it will be as the days of Noah. When you flip over there the book of Genesis and you see what it was like in the days of Noah, men was constantly evil and wicked in their hearts and in their minds and it made its way out into the culture. Violence was all over the face of the earth, even to the point where God was saying, I'm fed up and sick and tired of what's taking place, to the point in which he told Noah to build an ark and to tell folks that judgment is coming, a flood is coming, and eventually he did wipe everybody and everything off the face of the earth to a worldwide flood. He said that's how it's going to be in the last days. Folks, when you look out here in this world today, that's how it is, folks. That's the way that we're going. The morality of humanity has, has just continued to get worse and worse. I mean, when you have to talk about the debate of abortion, when you're having to debate that of the homosexual agenda or transgender movement, if you're having to sit here and discuss all these other different things that people want to say is right, when the Bible plainly declares it's wrong, we have a problem, folks. But there's still hope today. And that hope is found in Christ. When we find that John was writing there the first epistle, you know, we find later on he's writing from the book of, uh, the book of Revelation from the Isle of Patmos. Well, the culture of John's day was the same as, as Paul and there in the Roman culture. And guess what? It was a mess then too. I mean, it was the same similar type of things going on in that day as it is today. And we know that it was a mess, but he still had that hope, and that hope was found in Christ Jesus. And so I want to see just a few things in this, these verses that we read this morning about the victory. And as we think about the victory, I want you to think about your own personal life for a minute. I don't want you to thinking about everything else. I want you to think about your own personal life. Because at the end of the day, I want you to understand something. This world ain't getting better, folks. This world's getting worse. And, and, and there's not a thing that you and I are going to do to change that. And you say, well, that doesn't sound good at all. Where is that hope at? Well, our hope is beyond this world, okay? I'm looking forward to the return of Jesus. I'm looking forward to a new heaven, a new earth, a new, new Jerusalem coming down from glory. I'm looking forward to the day when Satan is cast into the lake of fire to rear up his ugly head no more. I'm looking forward to the day where there is no sin, Satan, and the old man that I was and am today. I I'm looking forward to a new glorified body. I'm looking to a place way beyond this world. Okay, but in the meantime, I want us to understand that this world in of itself is not getting better, but you yourself can still have victory. You yourself can experience personal revival. You yourself can experience a growth at being saved and having a growing relationship with the one true and living God of the universe. You, you can do that personally. That can also spread to your families. That can be us as a church. And we can make some difference in our community one life at a time. I'm not saying that. But I do want us to understand that when you read the Bible, things aren't getting better. They're getting worse first. You know, it's going to get dark before we see the glory of the S-O-N. 
And so as we think about that, I want you to think about your own personal life. Do you have victory today in Christ Jesus? Do you know him as your own personal Lord and Savior? If you die today, you know you're going to heaven beyond a shadow of doubt. Not I hope so, not a maybe so, but you know beyond a shadow of doubt because you know that you've been born again. Not just because you got baptized, not because you're a member of a church, not because you gave your tithes and your offerings this morning, but because you know that you have turned from your sin and repentance and you have put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, the one true and living God who came, became a man for you, who lived a perfect life for you, who died on the cross for you, who rose again for you, who brought conviction in your heart and you said yes to him. See, if you've never been born again, if you've never been saved, you don't have that hope of eternal life, folks. It's not, you, you can't ride the coattail of somebody else you know, my kids can't say, well, my daddy was a Baptist minister. Or, or somebody else can't say, well, I was raised in church. I've been in church ever since I was conceived and I was in the womb and I, I've been drugged to church every time the doors were open. That ain't good enough, folks. You can't say, well, I taught Sunday school classes, I've drove buses, and I've done the sound system, and I've done all these other things. That's not good enough, folks. You can't tell I've gave my money and I've gave my time and I've done all these good works in, in the name of Jesus. That's not good enough because you got to know him. You have to be born from above. You have to know that you're saved. And when you say that you're saved, then some things should follow that. You ought to be able to say, you know what? I remember what it was like before I got saved. And you ought to be able to say how you've been changed since you've been saved. And when you go through your walk with Jesus and you have your failures and you have the times of sin in your life, you can also say, when I did that, God corrected me. God disciplined me. God showed me that I was a saved person because of the disciplinary action that happened in my life. If you claim to be a saved person, but you don't have no desire to live for God, you don't care about the things of God, you can live how the world wants to, and there's no discipline of God in your life, I'm here to tell you, you're not a child of God. You need to get saved. You need to be born again. And that's not something my opinion. That's what the author of Hebrews says. The author of Hebrews plainly states that he chastises all of his children. And, and if you are not disciplined by God, the plain language of the King James translation says you're a bastard. That means that you do not have a heavenly father. And, and so it may sound like a shocking word today, but it's not that shocking. You're either born again, adopted in the family of God, or you're not. And if you claim to be saved, then you're going to live for Jesus and there's going to be some change in your life. And even if there's some failures, and there will be, you're going to have some correction in your life. There's going to be some discipline in your life. There's going to be conviction in your heart. There's going to be that which brings you back to a place to where you need to be. So as we think about the victory, it says this, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. And what we find here is that this victory, as we already alluded to, starts by knowing that you are saved. And he says, in order to be saved, you have to believe the right thing. You understand that today? That in order to be born again, you have got to believe the right thing. You can't just believe whatever you want to and go to heaven. You can't do it. Some people think that you can. Some people have this mentality. Well, it's just up to you to just come up and determine it on your own and so on and so forth. This doesn't work that way. In order to be saved, guess what happens? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And as the word of God is proclaimed to you, guess what has to happen? You and I need to be convicted of our sin, but then we have to, be, we have to believe the right thing. The Bible says in John chapter 1 and verse 11 that Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not. And so when Jesus, who is God, enrobed himself in flesh, took on human form, he did so through the seed of Abraham as the promise was supposed to be. And so he was Jewish by physical descent. And when he showed up there, his own received him not. But it goes on to say in verse 12, but as many as did receive him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God even to those who believe on his name. See, you have to believe and receive the right thing. You're the right person. You have to put your trust and faith in Jesus. So when John says that we must believe that Jesus is the Christ, what he is saying is you've got to believe he is the Messiah. 
you got to believe he is the anointed one. You've got to believe that he is the promised redeemer as it was promised and declared in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Y'all would remember the story, I'm sure, that when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they, they recognized their nakedness then. And when God would show up in the cool of the day, after they had sinned and took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they hid themselves. They knew something was wrong. And they hid themselves from God, and God cries out to where are you, Adam? And Adam and Eve finally make themselves known, and they have covered their nakedness with their fig leaves. And God says, what have you done? And they began this conversation as God confronts them in their sinful ways. You know, it was, Adam, what happened? And he says, this woman that you gave me, she gave me the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and I ate of it. What have you done? Well, man, this woman says the serpent, he has deceived me. And so God goes on to talk about some, some initial judgment that's going to happen, what's going to happen to woman because of her sin and childbearing and so on and so forth, and then also with man on what's going to happen with his provisions. But then he goes over to Satan, and he was in the form of the serpent. He says, listen, you're going to crawl on your belly from now on, and also you're going to know that through the seed of a woman is one going to come, and when this one shows up, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And that was the very first promise of a redeemer. That was the Christ. That was the promise of the Christ, the anointed one. The word Christ is simply the Greek translation of what we would, what in the Hebrew would be Messiah. And so he said, this here is the Christ. And so in order to be saved, you have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the promised seed of Genesis 3.15. You have to believe the right thing, that, that Jesus is God. He always has been, and he always will be. But then in the fullness of time, he became a man. God in the flesh, through a miraculous conception, through the virgin birth, God in the flesh, without sin, the light of the world in whom there is no darkness at all, yet he walked among sinful humanity, and he never sinned himself, though he was tempted in all ways like unto man. But then he became our sin, and then he went to our cross, and he died in our place. See, in order to have victory first, you got to get to the main point of things. You have to know that you're saved, that you believe the right thing. And listen, Jesus isn't just a way to heaven. He's the only way to heaven. And he said of himself in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man come to the Father but by me. Later on in the book of Acts, Peter would say that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Folks, Jesus said in John chapter 3 that in order to even see the kingdom of God, you've got to be born again. You cannot see the kingdom of God, except you be born again. And he said, how is it that you are saved? Well, in John chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you remember that when Paul was there in the jail in Philippi, and, and the Philippian jailer was about to kill himself because he thought everybody had escaped? And Paul said, don't harm yourself, for we're all here. And that Philippian jailer said, well, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And he said, well, what, what is it that you believe? Well, you, you got to believe what the Bible says about it. I guarantee you that Paul was preaching throughout that night before the great earthquake, before the doors opened up, before the, the opportunity of escape happened, was there that he was sharing the truth of the gospel. Paul and Silas were singing, and no doubt they were preaching about the, the need of repentance of sin and trusting in who Jesus is. And so he said, you got to believe on Jesus. He would say it like this, that if you and I would confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. It says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, when we talk about believing in Jesus, it's not simply repeating a prayer. See, when I talk with little Emma, she's, you know, a younger child. When I talk to her about being baptized and then being saved, I didn't just say, well, if you just repeat this prayer after me, everything's going to be fine. 
That's not what I did. I helped her. But before we ever prayed, I wanted her to have an understanding of who she was calling out to, who that she was going to receive, that Jesus is not just a good man. Jesus was not just a prophet of old. He was not just a religious leader. He was not anything just like that. No, he is God. He is the second person of the Trinity. He became a man. He lived perfect. He died in our place. He rose again. And there's no other way to have forgiveness of sin and eternal life but through him. That's it. So in order to be saved, folks, you've got to know that you have trusted in him. And that's the first part of having victory in this old world, knowing that you are saved. If you don't know that today, you need to settle that today. No better time, no better place than the here and now to trust in Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, to turn from your sin and repentance and turn to him. And you say, well, Brother Anthony, for repentance, that means there's going to have to be some change in my life. I agree with that. That's what repentance is all about. It's changing. You say, I just don't know if I can fix it on my own, Brother Anthony. I just don't know about that. Well, that's the good thing about it. You don't have to do it on your own. See, when you repent, that means that you're going to change the way you think about things. And that's what things that happen first. You have to change. When you're living a life of sin, you got to recognize that it's sinful, and you got to realize that I'm going to turn from it, and I'm going to turn to Jesus. I can't fix it on my own. I can't get cleaned up on my own. If you could do that on your own, he had never went to the cross for you. But you got to at least be willing to turn from it and say, I can't do it on my own, so I'm going to turn to you, Jesus. And as you confess your sin to him and, and you cry out to him, then he will come inside of you through the person of the Holy Spirit. And then as he forgives you and saves you, he then will begin to shape you into the person you're supposed to be. That's what it means to be born again, born from above. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, when you're born again, old things pass away. And behold, all things become new. He begins to work on you according to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. He who begins the good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 teaches us that he has predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his dear son. If you're his workmanship, as it says in the book of Ephesians as well, chapter 2 and verse 10, he's going to shape you and mold you to become workers of his. You've got to trust in him. You've got to repent. You've got to know that you put your, your, your life in the hands of Jesus and ask him to save you. You've got to know you're saved. Not just going to church, not going through religious rituals, but knowing you are born again. That's where it starts. That everyone believes that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the anointed one, that he is the Savior. He goes on to say, and everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. What it's saying is, hey, if you're a saved person, guess what? That's where it starts to experience victory. But guess where the next step is? Not just loving him, but loving each other. In the last couple of sermons, we've been talking about the love of God and the presence of the love of God in the church and how the atmosphere of the church must be such that we know how to love each other. Because to say that you love God, but not love the brethren, it's a contradiction. It, it's absolutely impossible to say that I'm walking with Jesus, loving Jesus, in right relationship with Jesus, and not be in right relationship with other believers. It can't be that way. It doesn't work that way. Because when you get saved, you become part of the church. You're baptized into the body of Christ, and not through baptism, water baptism, but through spiritual baptism. The Holy Spirit brings you into the body of Christ, and you become one with Jesus. And so other believers also come into that spiritual body of Christ when they trust in Jesus. And so we are one together under the head of Jesus. So when we say that we love him, we also, guess what? Love each other. And you know what? You cannot experience victory in this world if you don't love the brethren. It's an impossible thing. The most miserable people on the face of the earth are saved people that are out of fellowship with God, out of fellowship with believers. It's not lost people. Lost people go through this world. They don't even think about God a lot of times. I know I went 18 years of my life not really thinking about the things of God before I got saved. And, and before I got saved, the reason I started thinking about God was really because somebody started telling me about God. But left to myself, 
I didn't think about nothing but Anthony and my current circumstances of where I was at. I didn't think about going to church. I drove all over where I grew up in Fairfield, Ohio, and never really even seen a church. And then after I got saved and I went back around where I lived, guess what I started seeing? Churches on every corner. But I didn't know they was there before. You know why? Because I didn't think a thing about them. I didn't think about the people in them, and I didn't think about what they represented. I sure didn't think about the God in whom they supposedly was worshiping or preaching about and have no clue about it. But when somebody started sharing the gospel with me, I started thinking about my own sin, and I started thinking about then what Jesus did on the cross and who Jesus was. And eventually, as through the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the, and the, and the illumination of my heart and my mind to the gospel, I surrendered to that. And it gave my life to Jesus. And, and now it's been over 24 years, not much more, just a few days. But last, the 20th, this past Tuesday, I guess it was, as I turned 24 years old in the Lord. From that point on, I started thinking about nothing about my relationship with Jesus, but what about other, other people in Christ? Jesus said those who are his family are those who do the will of his Father. We are adopted into the family of God. He says that everyone that, that is saved, don't just believe that Jesus is the Christ, but you love him that begat. You love the one that has begotten you into new life, but you also love them that were begotten of him. And it says in verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. And for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. When I think about victory. I think about having victory in, in this world because I've trusted Jesus who overcame this world. When I look out here in this world and I see all the economies a wreck, and I think about how is everything going up, but the dollar is, is not near as valuable. It just doesn't seem like it goes near as far. How are we going to continue to be sustained? When you think about all of the mess going on in this world, the uncertainty of what's happening in our own country, every time you turn around, some ignorance going on. Every time you turn around. You say, what are you going to do in that? When you see all the stuff and the unsettlement, unsettlement and all of the, the turmoil that's going on in our world as a whole, he said, how are we going to face tomorrow? You know what I do? I think, he's got this. He's got this. Is God sweating the, the price of gas? No. Is he sweating the price of, of, of a loaf of bread? No. No, you know why? Because he said he's going to give us this day our daily bread. He didn't say as long as he stay under this amount of money, I'm going to take care of you. He said, you seek first my kingdom, my righteousness. I'm going to take care of every need you got. And then no matter what Satan tries to do, no matter how bad the world gets to going about it, we know we serve a God who's in control and can do all things. And so when there's things like this, like, all right, I'm going to live for him. And then what are we supposed to do also? Have victory in this world, not just trusting in him, but loving each other. The family's got to stick together, folks. You know? No, we ain't just talking about biological family. I'm talking about really those that are covered by the blood. Those are part of the family of God. That's what the real family's all about, isn't it? I mean, at the end of the day, that's where it's at. You say, How do you, what, what do you say about that? Well, listen, you can be as close as you want to your biological family. If some of your family dies without Jesus, they're going to go to hell when they die. And if you're saved, you're going to go to heaven. And guess what? You're not going to be with them forever. Who are you going to be with? Them? Only those who come through the blood of the Lamb. Only those who are born again. Those are the true family of God, folks. And we got to learn how to love each other. To have victory in this world, you got to have each other. And you got to learn how to love each other. You know, we claim the name of Christ. We got to learn how to love each other the way that Jesus loved us. And we looked at that before. He said, Jesus gave his life for the church. What kind of expectation does he have for us in loving each other? In that same mentality. That we'd give ourselves for the brethren. And he says, this is how we know. We, we, we love those that are begotten of him. And he says this in verse 2 and 3, as we've already read, that, if we, that this is how we know that we love the children of God when, you know, and, and when we love God and keep his commandments. 
For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. How about just being obedient to Jesus? How do you overcome this world? Being obedient to Him. You know what the problem is today with the church? A lack of commitment to the things of God. He said, well, I, I, I can do what I want to do. No, you've been saved if you trusted Jesus. You've been saved and set free from the penalty of sin. You've been justified from that. That's, that's justification. You're going through the process of sanctification. That's being delivered from the power of sin. But you've never been set free to do whatever you want to. You say, well, I believe that when you're saved, you're always saved. So do I. But I also believe if you're really saved, you think you're going to get out and do what you want to, God's going to hunt you down. And he's going to discipline you. He's going to correct you. But if you say you're saved and you go out here and live like the world and you have no correction, you're not saved, folks. Let me tell you something. You guys claim to be saved and you say, well, you know, I, I come to worship service whenever I feel like it. Or I'll give however I want to. You know, or I'll, I'll be a part, I'll participate in ministry however I want. I'm going to have to be committed. That's just, that's just something that, that the preachers come up with. No. Do a little Bible study. I remember talking to a friend of mine, and uh, I, I remember years ago we were friends. And was, I was over in Manchester anyway. We were friends, and we disagreed on some things. Disagreed things on alcohol. We disagreed on some other things. You know, but we're still friends. And I remember years later, we started reading the Bible together. He called me up every once in a while and said, hey, what, what, Bible, what, what book in the Bible should we be reading? And so we, we pick one of them New Testament epistles, like we're reading the Galatians or Ephesians or whatever it may be. And we take the opportunity to pray together every day. And you know what he said one day? He said, man, you know what? I said, what? He said, I didn't know the Bible said all this stuff until I started reading it. And you know what? Some of that stuff we disagreed, I thought was right, and I thought you was wrong. He said, I started reading it in the Bible. I said, imagine that. Imagine that. I said, this ain't about the, me and you got two different opinions about what, what we think is philosophically correct or morally right. That ain't, that ain't what it's all about here. If you and I claim the name of Jesus, folks, this book's our standard. From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, we have a responsibility to read it, to study it, to rightly divide it so we can know the Word of God, so we can know how, what God thinks about things, so we're not out here thinking we're right when we're completely wrong. Because at the end of the day, it ain't what the preacher says and the standard, or the Sunday school teacher, or the deacon, or your mom, or your dad, or your own opinion. It is, what does the Word of God have to say about it? Now, if your mom and dad line up with the book, or the preacher lines up with the book, or the deacons line up with the book, then that's a good thing, and that's the right thing, and that's how we ought to go. But this is the book, folks. This is the standard. And this is how we have victory in Jesus. We know that we're saved because we trust in him and believe the right thing, we love each other as we are supposed to, and we keep his commandments. We follow after his word. You know, people say, well, Christianity isn't about a bunch of do's and don'ts. Not to be saved, it ain't. You get saved by the person and the works of Jesus alone, by grace through faith alone. But as a saved person... You're supposed to follow him. You're supposed to be obedient to him. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. John reiterated that. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And guess what? His commandments are not grievous. That means that you and I are burdened down by the commands of God. Do you know I've been saved 24 years, and living my life for Jesus has never been a burden. Jesus said plainly, you come unto me, I'll give you rest. My burden's easy, right? Or, or, you know, and so he's like, I'm light. Everything, I, my, my teaching, my, my, my burden, all that stuff is light and easy. Follow after him. I, I'm never going to say, look back and say, man, I live for him. It's just been an impossible thing, and it has just wore me out for 24 years. No. 
No, it's not how it works. Because when you follow after him and you take heed to his word, guess what? You're not doing it by yourself. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. The word of God then begins to shape you, mold you. And, and as, you, as you're growing in that, guess what? It is it's amazing the freedom you have. It's amazing the, the victory you have. You don't have to be defeated in, de in despair, looking out here in the world, wondering what am I going to do now with all this craziness going on. You know, I'm getting older, you know, and, and my kids, you know, they're getting older. And then I think, you know what? You know, if Lord tarries his return, it ain't going to be long before somebody's put me in the ground somewhere. What about them? You know, what are they going to do? You know, well, this world's a mess for them and all these other kids coming up behind them. He said, this world ain't fit for nobody, and it's not. But Jesus is big enough. Jesus can handle it. He can take care of them. You know? It says this in verse 4 and 5. We're going to close up. He says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. See, believe in the right thing. We kind of go full circle here. You believe he's the Christ. He's the promised seed of Genesis 3.15. He is God in the flesh. You got to believe that he is 100% man. Over here, you're believing he's 100% God. See, it's, it's like bookends it. What you believe about Jesus is what holds everything else together. You know, so, so when you think about Jesus, we're thinking about him as, as God and man at the same time. You know, when we think about God as a whole, we're thinking about God as one in nature, three in persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three distinct personages that have the same nature. That's the God of the Bible. You can't take one of those personages out and have the God of the Bible. He's a triune God. You know, one nature, three distinct persons. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, has two natures, one person. 100% human and 100% God at the same time. When you believe the right thing about Jesus and are born again, you overcome the world because he overcame the world. How do you do it? By faith. You remember how, how faith comes about, right? It's not because oh, I feel good today. It's not because Miss Stephanie led us into some spirit-filled worship songs and you moved in your heart. If you weren't moved this morning, something wrong. I don't care if it was a little bit slower paced today. I'm going to tell you something. During the worship service, there's a sweet spirit here today in the move in our midst, you know. And, and I think about God in his grace and his presence here. But even if you're touched emotionally, that's not faith. What is faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so as you and I grow in our knowledge of the scripture, then we overcome the world through Jesus as we put our faith in him because he overcame the world. So what about you today? Would you consider your life a life of victory? Hmm? The Lord said to Joshua, as he was going to lead the people of Israel across the Jordan River and then began to give them in the hands, give into their hands the people groups that were in the land of Canaan. And you remember what he told them? He said, you need to make sure that you meditate upon the word of God day and night. And don't depart to the left or to the right. And as you do what it says, I'm going to be with you every step. I'm going to give you a little paraphrase, but that's what it says. You can go back to Joshua chapter 1, start reading if you don't believe me. And then he says this, wherever you go, you will have success. You will prosper. So you think, when we think about overcoming this world, you ask yourself, do I, do I have victory today in Christ? Do I have victory over this world here? You know? And if you don't, and you need to ask yourself, why don't I? Am I saved? Because that's where it starts, right? 
That's, that's where our book ends. Do I know Christ? You know, do I believe he is the Christ? Do I believe he is the son of God? Do I know that I'm saved? Have I repented of my sin? Have I trusted Jesus? It's my own personal Lord and Savior. That's where the victory starts. If you can say, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt I'm saved, then the question is, do you love the brethren? How's your relationship with the church? Huh? Are you part of the church like you're supposed to be? Oh, I'm not asking if you showed up to worship service. We say this all the time, I'm going to church. What is that? To be honest with you. What is that? Um, to the building? No. The church is the people. So we come together as a worship service, as the church. You know, but are you where you need to be in the church? If you're saved, have you followed through on believer's baptism? As a saved person, are you actively involved in, in the local church that you, you're a part of? Do you think God wants you there? You're fed there. You, you're also able to help other folks grow in their faith. Are you part of the ministry? Are you exercising your gifts, your talents? Huh? Are you, are you supporting the ministry with yourself as a living sacrifice financially? Are you giving back in your tithes and your offerings like you're supposed to? Do you love brothers and sisters in Christ? Hmm? Is your relationship with the church, are you committed? Are you, can you be counted upon? Are you dependable? You know? Think about that for a minute. Then, then, then all that ties in too. About about your commandments? Are you being obedient to the commands of Jesus? You know? And some of those things I already said to you about your relationship with the church, you know, they just go hand in hand with the commands. That's where they come from. You say, man, I'm just, I'm just, I feel victorious. I don't feel victorious. I feel defeated. You know? Well, why? Why? When we've overcome, how do you overcome? Through your faith in Jesus. It's just a matter of what you're doing with that. No reason for any saved person to be defeated. And there's no reason for any lost person to stay defeated. The cross and the empty tomb is plenty of resource for all of us to have victory this morning. Man, no matter what's going on in your life, whatever sin you struggle with, guess what? That sin don't have to have you in chain. Uh-uh. No. Remember what Paul said in the book of Romans? He says, you and I die with Jesus to sin. How can a dead man be under the control of sin anymore? But then we raise to walk in the newness of life. So we don't have to be enchained to the sin. We've overcome it through Jesus, right? But what we going to do as a saved person, come confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, help us to get loose of that sin and go about our business like we're supposed to for Jesus. What about you today? No matter me, if you're a visitor here today, if you're a member here today, as God has spoke to your heart, this altar is open. I'm not asking you to do anything, but it's to do business with God today. Do business with God as he has spoke to your heart. Miss Stephanie, if you'll make your way up here, and those are going to help with the invitation. This, this is your opportunity. As God spoke to you to respond to him this morning, let's pray. Father, we bow before you right now in the name of Jesus and ask you to move during this invitation. Lord, if there's someone lost and needs to be saved, I pray even right now where they're at, as you're dealing with their hearts, that they'd be willing to pray and ask you to come into their heart and their life. That they would repent. That they, they confess to you that they're sinners. And they want to turn from their sin, and they're looking to you, asking you to come into their life as they believe that you are God who became a man for them, who died on the cross for their sin, who rose again from the dead, overcoming their sin. They commit their life to you. For us who are saved today, Lord Jesus, I pray that we had done some self-examination of what kind of victory we have in our own personal lives. And Lord, we've overcome this world in you. We know that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We know that if you're for us, who can be against us? You know, if all these things are true and they are, <coughs> then we should not have any defeat in our life. Not by old man, not by sin. Not by anything else, not by Satan. He's a defeated foe. Uh, when he shows up, starts running his mouth, all we have to do is draw nigh to God. All we got to do is resist the devil, and he's got to flee. So, Lord, I pray that we'd examine ourselves and 
And as we have, well, we come and do business with you, with you and respond, getting out of our comfort zone, humbling ourselves, and allowing you to lift us up. Do a work that only you can as we trust in you. There is invitation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.